this is going to be uh, the Mark Edit Webinar 3. So let me share my screen here. All right, there we go. So let me pull up the presentation. All right, as always, uh, I would like to take an opportunity to thank Carly for uh, allowing us to make these webinars available online. Um, so these will be made available. Um, like like all of them, they're, they're uh, being processed and made available um, at the URL below. So thank you again. All right, so the particular session today is going to be on RDA and beyond. Um, so let's go ahead and go to there. So the topics of conversation today are going to be on um, how Mark Edit works with RDA, specifically working with the RDA helper. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the options, features, limitations, um, as well as some of the integration uh, possibilities, so specifically running the tool standalone, um, as well as running it as an integrated part of a larger workflow. Um, that will end up having us touch just uh, briefly on working within the Mark Editor, which will be part of a, a future webinar. Um, but I think that it's a, a good time to, to bring that particular part of it up, uh, since we'll be at the RDA Helper. After talking about the RDA Helper, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, what I've called the Mark Next Workbench. These are a set of experimental tools that allow folks um, who are interested in experimenting with BibFrame or considering how linked data concepts might be applied to existing Mark records, uh, begin to play with that and start looking at it within their own institution. There components that are available uh, in the, the default version of MarkEdit. So um, with that, let's go ahead and get started. So I like this picture. I um, started getting questions about RDA probably about two or three years before um, it really started being, uh, before it um, made its Way, officially made its way uh, to be available and a lot of the questions uh, at workshops or at conferences it tended to be around how would um, RDA impact MarkEdit or how uh, MarkEdit may eventually support um, RDA. Uh, from the applications perspective, um, RDA is just another part of the data that's applied to a Mark record. Uh, remember MarkEdit's Mark agnostic, so it doesn't particularly care uh, what the rules are that are applied. Um, so from that perspective, the, the changes really weren't that big of a deal. Um, I think the biggest concerns that kept coming up were a lot of people had um, kind of these gut reactions to it. And, and what ended up happening is there were a lot of common questions that came up. Um, probably the most concerning was about the GMD. Uh, and that, that was actually a valid concern, specifically for public libraries, where a lot of their local systems tended to tie um, uh, public interface uh, components to the presence or lack of presence of a GMD. Um, the other one was um, thinking about um, how to work with data that wasn't in RDA. So uh, we will probably forever live in a hybrid environment, but there were a number of institutions that were thinking um, and wondering what would happen if on day one they made a commitment to exclusively create RDA data, how were they going to have to deal with other people's data, and was that going to involve a large amount of work um, porting um, on RDA data, um, or porting AAC or data, two data into RDA um, simply for their local use. Um, the other questions tended to be around vendor data, and in fact, a lot of vendor data still doesn't have RDA information applied to it. Um, do we care? And if you have made the decision to um, pretty much exclusively work with RDA data, um, do you worry about the vendor data since those tend to be large sets that you don't have control over? Uh, do you care about legacy data? Uh, I'm not sure of any institution that has um, gone back and uh, converted their entire database um, into RDA, but I do know of a number of institutions that as they go back and touch records, um, they go through the process of converting that um, information into um, an RDA compliant record. Um, and so, so what happens when you deal with large legacy data sets? Um, 
the other questions that tended to come up is is there was a number of institutions that were very early adopters before RDA became um, official in uh, 2013. And um, given that RDA has been a fluid um, uh, a fluid standard, um, how would you deal with those records that were now incomplete, that weren't incomplete a year ago? Um, and then uh, lastly, the same thing always kept coming up is, is the GMD. So these were kind of the common questions that kept, get asked, kept being asked over and over again. And so one of the things that I started to think about is how could we provide a helper, a bridge between AACR2 and RDA. So um, after working on it for uh, probably about eight months to a year, um, in December 2012, so prior to um, the March 2013 cutover date, um, when any of the national libraries went live with RDA, uh, I introduced something called the RDA helper. And it, it was really designed um, to do a couple of things. Um, one was to provide an automated conversion uh, between AACR2 and RDA. Um, one was to help folks who had created um, more what I like to think of as provisional RDA records, um, those that were created prior to um, the official uh, go live date in uh, 2013. Um, and we're now lacking information and ability to upgrade those records, some of which there is for some institutions that, that ended up being thousands of records. Um, and then to try and address concerns that some librarians had um, around the reliance on some metadata that was being removed. Um, and trying to do this in a way that allowed people to pick and choose the conversions that they wanted to take, as well as to avoid having to step into some of the, the um, uh, more theoretical discussions that happen around RDA. So, for example, um, you know, when do you put that uh, subfield E in the 040? Uh, for some folks, they would argue it would be any time you do a conversion. For other folks, they would argue that RDA represents more of a content change, and just updating the skid, the structure of the data doesn't represent um, enough in for uh, enough of a change to um, apply that value. So, rather than than having the tool make those decisions, trying to leave that a lot up to the uh, individual cataloger. Um, additionally, uh, trying to make the tool flexible. So um, while there are standard fields where abbreviation expansion happens um, and there are standard abbreviations, the reality of the thing is uh, a lot of us um, that do cataloging of records also have local best practices, which uh, may mean that we need to do abbreviation expansion or have um, local abbreviations that need to be expanded. And so the ability to be able to support that as well. So the scope of the RDA helper has been looking at practical implementation of RDA elements into MARC. So specifically, that meant looking at uh, the 33x series, the 34x series, the 38x series, um, evaluating 260s, uh, abbreviation expansion, qualifying values, um, and then dealing with um, uh, the 26064, um, as well as um, uh, handling the uh, copyright symbols and uh, phonographic symbols um, that go with that, um, as well as dealing with um, GMD processing. We'll take a look at all that in a second. So the question that comes up is, can you really do this um, and do it well? And I, and I think that the answer is yes. Um, a number of the data elements that get created um, either are available within a MARC record um, as coded data, or at least you hope are, is there as coded data, um, or it can be extrapolated based on an analysis of multiple data fields. And so within the RDA helper, um, the process that gets used is actually more of a heuristic one. Um, there is an evaluation of the controlled vocabulary elements, but there is um, a more um, deep analysis of a wide variety of uh, fields that are within a MARC record to try and make the best decisions possible on how a specific element should be generated. 
So the most important data points being um, the information found in the LDR, the 07, 008, and 06 when present, um, the GMD, uh, the 856, uh, the 300, um, the 1X uh, field, specifically the 130, the 240, the 273, and 74. And so those elements represent um, sp specific data points that can be used and extrapolated uh, to be able to generate the, the specific RDA elements that we're looking for. Um, RDF, uh, the abbreviation expansion, um, is especially challenging and crazy making. Um, it's also the most complicated and time consuming part of the process. Uh, the reason for that being that there is, in addition to just real world examples of how things work, um, you have uh, local practice. And so if you look at this example, you can see that there's a wide range of variation here that any tool needs to be able to understand. So anything from the 1V period to 1 volume to 1 spelled out in a letter V to 1 volumes to V uppercase, lowercase, 12 application needs to be able to know when something is a volume or when it is volumes and needs to be able to correct when something has been expanded uh, has been labeled incorrectly um, it's a it is a an interesting problem and like I said one that um, is is the most time-consuming part of the process to uh, work around this to some degree uh, the way that mark edit implements abbreviation expansion um, and we'll look at this in one second, is as a straight in-stream process, but also um, supports regular expressions so that uh, users have the ability to create um, very complicated string matching um, or replacements or um, abbreviations. Of course, that means that if you're using regular expressions, you need to be very careful um, and take your time and evaluate how those expressions are interpreted uh, by the processor so that you don't end up expressions that may uh, delete or um, change more data than you think you're going to change. Uh, let's see here. Oh, so I, I think I mentioned this already. Um, yeah, so abbreviation expansion. I, I wanted it to be very flexible. We'll see it in a second. Um, uh, like I said, there's, there's the standard fields, but we also need to be able to add local abbreviations, foreign language abbreviations. Um, the abbreviation list I used was tied specifically to Mark 21, but there are other abbreviations that would need to be used, um, and also the ability to be um, relatively easy to use and understand. At least that's that's the hope. That is the goal to try and make this the, as easy to use as possible. Uh, let's see. So the RDA helper um, is a tool that can be um, used in a variety of different ways um, and can be um, picked up. Uh, uh, so that it, it displays in different places. So uh, in the first session, I believe, we talked about the preferences. Um, this is one of the applications that you can have show up on the Mark Edit main window. And in my application, I do have it set to show up on the main window. So when we open it up, we'll see it there. Um, you can set that in the preferences. Uh, the other place that it shows up is in the Tools menu um, on the main program window. Uh, that where these are the two places where you're, you would interact with the um, RDA helper as a standalone program. Uh, the application also shows up in the Mark Editor, and I will show you that here shortly. Uh, so this is the RDA helper itself. It's a standalone or integrated application. You can see um, from the screenshot here that the application breaks down um, the processing components into groups. So you have the 336, um, the 337, and 338, which are paired together, um, in part because uh, my experience has been that the presence of a 338 um, doesn't, the 338 doesn't appear to um, uh, be possible without a 337, so those are paired together, uh, given the need for one or the other. Um, there's the 344, 345, 4647, uh, 38081, the 260, 64 evaluations, the qualifying data, your option to decide whether you want to modify the 040 by adding a subfield E to the end, 
and then the ability to either delete GMD data or generate GMD data, and then the ex abbreviation expansion. One word of note, um, of all of the content elements that are on this screen, the 380 is probably the one that is um, most difficult to do um, and match cataloger judgment. Most of these uh, fields have a very specific set of characteristics that are able to be automated um, as part of a process or linked to a specific uh, controlled vocabulary. So there are a specific set of um, items that can be used um, in the description of that element. The 380 is, an, uh, is a free text field. Uh, there is no control vocabulary for that field, as far as I'm aware. And because of that, in the testing that I did early on working with a number of libraries, uh, PCC libraries that are working, that were working in RDA early on, the field that we had the most disagreement on was the 380 field. Uh, to make that work, I had to select um, a controlled vocabulary at the Library of Congress. And that vocabulary was chosen because it matches well with the data that's found in the control vocabulary and some other elements, um, or in the, in the control fields and, and a few other elements that get extrapolated. Because of that, sometimes that field will be much more general than maybe a cataloger would assign. And so that option is there so that if you find in your experience that that field is not helpful, you can uncheck it. Now the tool will remember which items were checked on last run. So when you open it the next time, those items will be checked. So let's say your, your best practices to not include specific fields or you don't want to do certain, certain um, parts of this process, you can leave them unchecked. Um, process the data, and then the next time you come back to the application, those elements won't be checked. All right, so let me go ahead and I'm going to step into the application um, so that we can look at the abbreviation expansion. All right, so here is the application. As I mentioned, um, I have the button here on the screen, but you can also find it under the tools button. Here's the RDA helper. Um, open it up. So the abbreviation expansion happens here. So we have a um, list. So this is the abbreviation list. It's just a plain text file. We click on the link and it opens up. And you can edit this list. So this list is all of the, the terms. Uh, on this side is the abbreviation, a tab, and then the uh, data that you want to um, have that abbreviation expand out to. Um, you can see an example of regular expressions right here um, for volumes. Uh, volume, like I said, is a pain because you're not, you have to determine whether it's a volume or multiple volumes. So this is a, a regular expression that demonstrates how to um, handle some of that volume data. Uh, additionally, uh, the tool has been defined to work with a default set of fields. So here's the edit fields button. Again, Again, just a plain text file. These are the fields that will be evaluated um, when processing data um, for field value uh, expansion. You can add or delete to this list. Uh, the format is very simple. Um, you put an equal sign and then the field that you want to evaluate. And if you want to evaluate, say for example, all the 500 fields, like um, this text document here says, you would put an equal five, and this, the program will then evaluate everything that has the equal five as the field name. So that means everything in the five XX elements. Let's say I wanted to just evaluate um, five fifty five five X fields, then I would have made this equal five five, and then I would just left it alone. So um, you just drop the you either define the entire um, field number or drop the last digit to have it. Um, process groups of uh, 10 um, of elements that you want to work with. Um, fairly straightforward, you make your change, you save the file, um, so just you know, save the file when you're done making your change and then you're good to go. Alright, from here um, you can see that you can select uh, none of the items or you can select all of the items. You can't obviously select to delete and generate the GMD at the same time, so this is one that will 
choose based on what you click on. Um, by default, it goes to delete the GMD, but you can definitely put it back. Um, and then you can decide whether or not you want to modify this value or not. So let's go ahead and, and, and process, of that, process one of these files. So I, I set aside um, a record here. This is a sample record, sample set of records. There are 10. Um, these have not had um, any RDA concepts applied to them. You can see the GMD, so this will be a good um, example set to work with. So um, we will go ahead and select this file. Now you can work with the data either in um, MRK format, which is marked at its mnemonic format, or by default, or you can pick a different file format here. So we'll go ahead and pick the mark one just to show you that you can do that. Um, and then you can save it, and you can save it either in the mnemonic format or in the uh, or save it back into the mark format if that's where you want to eventually go. I'm going to go ahead and save it into the mnemonic format instead. Um, so this will be our test file. Um, we'll go ahead and process the file, and it says that it's done. So we'll look at it. And you can see that um, as part of the generation process from the start of the record to the next, you can see that the 337, 338, uh, 347, and the 380 were all generated as part of this process. I asked it to generate a subfield E, so that was generated as part of the process. You will see that the 264 has been inserted in, in rather than the uh, 260. Um, you'll also see that here there was a GMD that has been removed. Um, so the data elements have been updated um, to um, reflect what I've asked it to do. Um, now I could actually add the GMD back um, in Mark Edit. You can interact with the RDA helper directly from Mark Editor. It's under Tools and RDA Helper. Um, I can select None, generate the GMD and run it and I look at it again see that in the 245 the GMD has been regenerated um, and placed into the proper position um, for the field placement back into the record so what this means is if you're working with um, RDA data and your system your local system needs a GMD you can actually regenerate it based off of the RDA data or if you have an ACR2 record and you need to generate a GMD data um, because you haven't, for some reason, locally you're not doing RDA um, in your local catalog or your local ILS system doesn't support the presence of these field elements. You can still use the RDA helper to generate the GMD for you as part of that process. Alright, so let me go back here. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, one thing to note, and I didn't have a, a specific example, so let me put one together really quickly. Um, in the one of the options is to adjust the control, the the command value, uh, the the copyright value. So within a mark record, a lot of times when um, copyright was set, and I know you, everybody here is reaching the it would say C um, rather than using the specific symbol. Um, MarkEdit has the ability to um, fix that uh, so that you can decide to use um, uh, the actual symbol itself rather than just a C. If, you, uh, if this box isn't checked, it'll just use the C uh, syntax. If that box is checked, then it will. Um, go through and replace uh, those elements. Um, so in this case, it replaced the element, um, set it up as a copyright field, and it, you can see that it added the mnemonic of copy. Um, had this been a uh, file that was in Unicode, it would have used the Unicode copyright symbol. But this is a Mark 8 record, so it used the appropriate Mark 8 field um, for that, that process. All right, let's go back to our slides. All right, so the GMD, uh, the 
the RDA helper is one of those tools that I look at as one that I, I think, um, I hope, uh, long term may be able to be, um, you know, pulled away at some point. I, I, I mean, I realize that it'll probably be something that we're in um, a hybrid environment for a very long time. Uh, but this, like I said, this was designed and developed as, a, as what I hope to be a, a bridge um, between kind of AACR2 and RDA. So, so maybe at some point we'll eventually be able to go away. But for now, this provides a, a way of making that change. Two links. Okay, and then I'll talk about um, the next part here. Um, let me make sure I'm not forgetting something. Oh, uh, the last thing I wanted to mention in the RDA helper, um, sometimes um, folks want to know exactly what's going on, a little bit more information about how these fields are being generated. Um, in the last special issue of the Journal of uh, Library Metadata, it was a special issue on RDA. Um, uh, there's actually an article um, that I had written that includes a, a table. Uh, that documents how each one of those fields are created and what are the specific uh, mark elements that are um, being utilized to, um, that are being evaluated and um, these data elements. So if you're interested in a little bit more information about how the RDA helper works um, and how it generates um, these data elements as it goes through the process, um, the, I would recommend uh, taking a look at that article. All right, so the last thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, be able to break this up into two sections, um, is what I call uh, Mark Next. So Mark Next is a, um, a workbench of sorts, um, a set of experimental tools um, that are being developed um, and provided as a way to explore concept and data models um, around things like linked data um, and bib frame. Uh, one of the things uh, folks don't realize is uh, while I, I don't actively catalog anymore, Mark Edit for me um, uh, gets used as a uh, avenue for for um, looking at different uh, things that revolve around my research interests. And so there are parts of Mark Edit that are actually hidden from users uh, because they represent ideas that are kind of half baked or um, they they just aren't done or ready or useful. Um, to the larger community. In fact, if they were available, they would probably be um, really confusing because they break. And I have a very high tolerance for things that, that break within my research process. Um, however, uh, with more and more people interested in how, um, how the library's metadata models may evolve, um, and uh, change, what I've been trying to do is take some of these experimental tools, uh, clean them up a little bit, and make them available uh, so that folks can um, start to uh, experiment and play a little bit. And, and even just uh, as catalogers um, who may be just peripherally interested, be able to start taking some of their real life data and seeing how this, this might be re represented um, within. A, a data model like BibFrame, and and I should point out that the the model that I'm using specifically um, within MarkEdit is a representation of the Library of Congress's implementation um, of the BibFrame model, uh, which is a, a which in my perspective is is very uh, faithful to Mark, um, whereas there are other um, uh, implementations that are uh, much less faithful, but they uh, are targeting a different use case. So, so understanding kind of how those different things work is, is also kind of interesting. So the tool has a couple of different resources. I'm going to highlight two, but we'll um, take a look at, um, I'll show you all, all four if you're uh, just to kind of quickly cover what they do. Um, the first one is what's called the BibFrame testbed. Uh, this is developed to mirror the LC BibFrame model um, for participants working with uh, Zephira and the LibHub initiative. There is actually a plugin um, that MarkEdit has that supports more um, a workflow for getting Mark and non-Mark data um, into that LibHub application. 
and I'm it has been reserved for the most part for folks who were participating in that project, but um, probably in the very near future will be um, made more widely available for folks interested in, in doing a little bit more, interested in seeing a little bit more how that works. Um, it was developed, like I said, as a way for catalogs to, catalogers to look at how their data might map into BibFrame. Um, these are sometimes very difficult things to just think about conceptually and on a theoretical basis. So having some the ability to take your your data, your your actual metadata, and run it through tool um, to be able to look at that, um, I think helps to provide some kind of a little bit more um, um, uh, helps to solidify the concepts a little bit. Um, and ideally, um, I'm thinking and experimenting with how one might create a uh, proof of concept content editor that is based on the BibFrame application profiles that implement a batch editing tool for BibFrame-like data. Um, and so that's something that's, that I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure when we'll get done, um, but it's something that I'm, I'm interested in looking at how that might be supported. All right, so the BibFrame test tool is a very simple tool. Um, this is the screenshot. I am going to go ahead and uh, bounce out of the application and, and take a look, or out of this, the presentation and, and walk you through the application really quickly. All right, so the, the BibFrame uh, tool is found um, here. It's the little uh, beaker here, um, the Mark Next beaker. Uh, and we open it up, and there are four tools. There's a BibFrame testbed, a JSON object viewer, um, a, a tool for linking identifiers, and then a Sparkle browser. Um, and I will just touch on the JSON viewer and the Sparkle browser, but I will talk about the BibFrame and the linked, view, uh, linked identifiers tool. So the BibFrame uh, test tool, it's a fairly straightforward to, tool. Like I said, it's, it's really designed um, to allow folks to um, evaluate their data under BibFrame concept, under the BibFrame concept model. Um, so we have source file, save file, file type. The tool's been attached to um, ArcEdit's um, uh, XML uh, engine so that you can process data that is in either Mark XML, EAD, FGDC, Mods, or Onyx. And the tool will process the data and then feed it through um, the uh, BibFrame converter pipeline. Um, because this is linked data, you need to have a base URL. In reality, um, you're likely, you likely don't have one right now. Um, so there's an example, uh, basically just a, a stand-in URL, so you can keep kind of how that data gets mapped. And then there's um, the XQuery URI. Uh, this, at the moment, makes use of the Library of Congress's um, XQuery uh, documents that they've been creating. Um, if you have your own um, XQuery documents, you can actually point the application to those and use those instead. Um, these are the, this is where that goes. Eventually, that'll probably change. Um, the XQuery doesn't scale very well, uh, especially when you start looking at large data conversions. So I'm, I'm going to be, uh, I am actually right now working on creating more of a native-based process that maybe uses more of a micro-language um, to allow folks to customize the translation, but can be compiled um, so large data processing can happen um, very quickly. Uh, data serialization, we have um, RDF, RDF raw, in triple JSON, and then this thing called an exhibit JSON, which is more of a flatter um, JSON file um, that loads well into the JSON object editor. In case you're interested in looking at what, in case you're interested in looking at it, maybe we'll. we'll process a data file and look at it that way. All right, so let's go ahead and grab a file. I'm going to grab a small file. So this one right here, this one has 10 records. We'll grab that file. Uh, we will save it as an XML file. And put our test file together. Um, the file type is MARC. Um, the program guesses that based on the extension, the XQuery API we leave there, and we will go ahead and process it. And off it goes, and it's going to take it a minute because what happens is the program has to actually go out to the web, 
um, download the xQuery statements, and there are a number of them. Uh, okay, looks like there's a... Actually, it looks like that file's not going to be a good file to use. One item's not... So just a minute, let me just get a different file here. Oh, just grab this one. See if this works better. Been experimenting a little bit with a different, uh, a different um, pro. There we go. I might have to look at my process. I've been experimenting a little bit with changing the some of the processing data, but um, some of the um, what I have found is that some um, bibliographic data, if it's missing certain elements, will cause the uh, Library of Congress's xQuery to fail. So my guess is that there's an element that's that expects to be there that's not there. So let me go ahead and look at the record that we just processed. It's this one right here. So we will open that record up really quickly. Uh, run and open that record and you can see um, that that record's been um, broken down, that mark record's been broken down so you see works um, instances, uh, as well as um, annotations, held item information, organization information. So, so the data is broken down appropriately, um, so you can actually take a look at how this information um, has been generated in um, this, uh, this model. So that's interesting. Um, but let's say you want to take it a step further. So we have a lot of legacy data. Actually, um, in case you're interested, let me just run this through the... Uh, I'll show you the JSON view really quick here. So we'll take our... Again, um, we are going to export it as a JSON file. So that's going to be... JSON file is basically a, an object-oriented version that, um, that uh, JavaScript can read. Um, that's sometimes easier for people to look at. We'll put the exhibit JSON, we'll process it. Um, record will get uh, finished. Uh, here in a second, again, it has to download all the data. Um, there's not very much uh, data caching that happens. We can open up the JSON viewer, which is a very simple viewer. Um, open up the uh, file itself, the JSON file. And Oh, it's being used by another process. I'll have to... We'll figure out what's going on. Anyways, if the other process wasn't using it, that should work. Um, I'm not going to bounce back and... Oh, I think it's it's probably being captured by an XML process. Anyway, or by the Internet Explorer, probably hasn't released it yet. So the JSON viewer would allow you to open that, that document and look at it. Um, you can... Look at it. Oh, just look at it outside of the viewer really quickly, so you can get a feel for what this looks like. Uh, there it is. So this is a JSON file. I'll just open it in WordPad really quickly. Something's still holding on to it. Oh well. Um, maybe it's Mark at it. Uh, let's just look really quickly. Maybe Mark Edit was holding on to it. Let's look. No, something's going. Something with uh, the tools not letting it go. Anyways, the JSON file is a uh, is an object for a file. I'll, uh, I will look back on my side and see what's going on. But there we go. Um, here's the, uh, the Apple. Here's what a JSON file looks like. It's basically a, a text-based array that can be um, picked up by uh, JavaScript. Uh, the JSON viewer breaks it down into a tree so you can look at how objects work. Um, but uh, uh, this tends to be more of a um, programming, you know, this is how most uh, uh, web applications would interact with the data. Um, but just an interesting serialization to look at. Okay, so we have a lot of legacy data. Legacy data um, uh, that needs to be linked. So as we move into the semantic world, um, a lot of our text strings are, are kind of 
uh, problematic. So, you know, we look at um, our, our data records here um, within of the files that we were just looking at. Um, there's a, a 10 records here, and what we have is we have a bunch of strings. So this right here, this name is a string. Um, subject is a string. And within the semantic world, what we're hoping is to eventually turn these into, into things. So um, links to um, references that uh, will stand in for these strings. And so one of the ways that we start um, being able to prepare for that is to create links within the data sets. So the link data tool um, is an experiment um, in how we might build those links. So in the MARC framework, uh, in the MARC specification, in the 1xx, 6xx, and 7xx fields, you have a subfield 0. Um, which is available, which is allowed for creating control, uh, for linking, putting the linking control number in. Um, personally, the, the, the format um, that, I, that shows up in the, uh, the, the specification um, is useless. It's, the, it's kind of the same format that you would find in 035, um, uh, kind of a, a prefix and then the number. Um, for machine actions, that's, that's fairly useless data. And so what we've been doing, um, a number of folks who have been looking at this and thinking about how we might start moving data forward in a semantic way, have been doing is saying that the, the subfield zero should actually be used to store URI information. So links to authorized forms of headings. And so that's what this tool does. This tool will actually embed um, URIs into the records. And so you have different identifier services that you can link to. So you can link to the Library of Congress. Um, you can use this tool to auto-detect subject IDs, which means that if you have mesh headings, it will go out and link to the National Library of Medicine instead. Um, you can also add multiple URIs. So um, you can link to both the Library of Congress as well as VIA, or only um, one of them rather than the other. Uh, so if I wanted to use VIA instead of um, the Library of Congress for my uh, people links, um, my, my um, links related to the 1 and 7xx, I could uncheck the Library of Congress and only use VIA as that process. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to grab my source file here. And we're just going to go ahead and grab uh, the same record that we were working with before. Let's go back to our source file here. And we're going to create one here, linked data. And go ahead and process it. And this takes a little bit of time. You'll see here that it's telling you how many records are being processed. The time being taken is actually because of content negotiation. It's having to talk to a lot of different servers. And so the amount of time it takes is based on the response rate of those servers. So now we can go ahead and process that data. So here's our link data. Break it so we can take a look at it. And we look at the information, we can see that in the 1xx field, the subfield 0, um, this VOF identifier has been created. And um, I've, been exper I've been making a, some experiment, working a little bit on cleaning up some of the linking because the, these services don't always work as well as I would like. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. But there we go. So there we go. So this is uh, this is a link to um, this particular um, user, and so you can see his preferred forms. And so from a, a link concept context, um, if I you could actually think about how a user could potentially use um, this information to do authority control, um, because you, if you were to follow this link and say this name came, let's say we added a death date at some point in the near future. Um, that link would redirect to the updated form, and that updated form could then be brought back and put into this record, and that URI could be updated. Um, likewise, if we go down here, let's see, 650s got picked up here. Uh, 
see if any other ones get You can see the 700s, some of them get, have gotten linked, uh, so like here, this one was linked. Um, here we go. So you can see here, these were have some uh, mesh headings. The mesh headings were picked up, pharmaceutical headings were picked up and utilized. Um, so um, as, the tool, as the tool goes through um, records and identifies um, makes queries against known identifiers, identifier services. If it can link to them, it pulls back um, the URI and inserts them into the MARC record. Now, I, this, the question that comes up um, a lot of times is, OK, um, that's interesting. Um, so, so what does that actually do for me? Um, and that's a great question, because uh, I don't know um, at this point. Uh, I don't think there's any library catalogs um, that deal with um, these URIs. In fact, I'm almost certain. Um, and even within uh, tools like WorldCat, where they have um, these concepts of work records and, and OCLs is doing a lot of interesting things around um, uh, linked data, uh, specifically around schema.org, um, the presence of that those links don't actually do anything as far as I'm aware within WorldCat. They don't, don't delete them, but they don't do anything yet. Um, the only place that I've seen actually making use of this data at this point is the LibHub initiative, where if data goes into um, the LibHub queue, the, the LibHub um, uh, database, if you filter data in and it has these linked elements, um, linked data elements, they actually get used somehow and you can actually see on the, the user interface this is where those references link out to the authorized headings um, that exist out on the web where these URIs point to um, so it's it's interesting to see that uh, but again will it help you right now um, if you do this as part of your normal workflow and load it into your library catalog probably not I don't think any of this information gets used. The idea is somewhere down the road, um, or potentially if you use your MARC data outside of your catalog within a system more linked data friendly, um, having that information within your records takes one step away. Um, the, the problem is we move our legacy data to um, a more of a semantic environment. This is going to have to happen at some point, and so potentially you can um, start experimenting with how to um, ease that transition um, if your data is likely to be used outside of a strictly MARC environment. And who knows what library catalogs will eventually do. Um, so this is a little bit more information I talked about about how the, um, the uh, linked data tool works. Ideally, I would love to be able to eventually put um, URIs on um, other elements like the 33x. 3-3x um, field, um, and I, I think even the 3-4x field, those are known controlled vocabularies. There are URIs that can be generated for them rather than just using string data. Um, but again, for whatever reason, um, these elements were created into MARC uh, and translated into MARC. It doesn't look like there was a... Um, it was a recognition that maybe we would like to work with something other than strings. And so there's there's not a, uh, a field that, that would allow you to put a URI into those elements. It would be interesting, though, to see if at some point the addition of a, of another, of a subfield zero, for example, um, was there, if people would start using those, um, embedding those URIs even within those, fail, those fields. Uh, let's see, and then there's the linked data tool, like I had mentioned. All right, so um, like always, uh, if you need help, um, there is additional help at the um, on the Mark Edit page, uh, YouTube, uh, where uh, this video eventually will get hosted. In addition, or at least a a, a cleaned up version of this video will be hosted. Um, Carly or Carly member, the 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 original will be um, on the Carly website and. There is always the uh, Mark Edit Listserv, which is available for um, asking questions, um, and they can be about of anything. Okay, so as long as uh, there aren't any more questions, uh, I think.
think that is 